Everything that you would want to know about the games business is certainly an answer here. That's the best perspective you could get. On. Corey Wade, I'm one of the founders of Sandbox. We're a company in New York. Uh, we have an office in San Francisco. Uh, we do PR, marketing, social media for games. We do stuff for like uh, Activision. Um, do all North American marketing for Codemasters. We do stuff with Remedy. We're the Alan Wake developers. Um, and uh, do work for CCP as a guy, EVE Online guys in, in, in Iceland. Um, what we do as a company is about probably 60% publicity, maybe 20% sort of marketing and brand, and about 20% social media. That's me. Uh, so my name is Chris Grant. I uh, am an editor. I um, worked for about six years for a site called Joystick, uh, which was owned by AOL. Uh, and then in January, I left to go work uh, for a company called Vox Media to launch a site uh, called Polygon. Um, in my experience as an editor, um, you know, over the last seven years or so, we've seen a really a huge shift um, in the industry um, from an industry that was really predicated um, increasingly on large teams and blockbuster games um, to one that is being disrupted by the opportunity of digital distribution. Um, and uh, that same opportunity, um, which is providing an alternative for the people who work on these big teams that fail. And so increasingly we're seeing these large games fail um, with a kind of smaller window of success. Um, and so you're, you know, it's almost weekly at this point, you're seeing uh, a group of people leave a major studio and go start an iOS game company or launch a Kickstarter or you know, make a Steam game. Um, and that opportunity for success there, uh, creative and financial, um, is relatively new, uh, probably for a lot of us in this room, but is it's actually really similar to the early days of gaming. You know, a lot of the teams were five or ten people, um, and a lot of the success was personal, not um, corporate. So, um, like Nathan pointed out, that's the opportunity that I think a city like Philadelphia has, which has never historically had game development. Um, and so those small five to 10 person teams never turned into 200 person teams uh, the way they have in you know, DC, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston. Um, but it also provides a lot of kind of unique challenges. If you are a two person team with no corporate benefactor and um, those windows, like I said before, are small. Um, how do you get attention? And how do you make sure that people know about your game um, and can find it? So uh, the interesting thing about this is it's something that I don't think that there's an actual answer for. There's no right model. Uh, the biggest game publishers in the world have not figured out the uh, iOS marketplace. They have ideas and strategies, but there's no winning solution. So some of it's you know, uh, making the right choices, some of it's luck, some of it's making a good game. Um, but yeah, a f fun topic. Well, um, as I said, I'm Sean Kane. Uh, I'm an attorney. I've spent about the last decade uh, focusing specifically on games. I'm actually one of the few attorneys that are actually in the space by choice and not by happenstance. Um, I, you know, picked it as an area that I really wanted to focus on. Um, I founded a boutique and did nothing for seven years but represent companies um, from all sizes, from, you know, a couple guys making an iOS game, obviously not seven years ago, but um, up into, you know, I represent, you know, my, of my personal client, Take-Two, Namco, Sega, um, and everything in between. So. Everything that I do tends to deal more on the um, IP side because that's my that's my background. Uh, so I deal with a lot of publishing agreements, or I'll deal with development agreements, or I'll deal with protecting intellectual property rights in games. Um, uh, about two years ago, uh, the law firm Pillsbury Winthrop uh, uh, approached me about moving my practice there, and they wanted to really make a uh, they're a large firm, there's about 800 lawyers, and they really wanted to make a play into the game space and be kind of considered the go-to 
uh, firm for, uh, for game law. Um, and so I moved my practice there and I now kind of uh, co-head a team of 35 people that look at the game space from a really 360 degree approach. So as I said, I'm more on the IP side, but we have team members who are, you know, patent lawyers, who are tax lawyers, um, who are M&A lawyers, who are private equity lawyers, and you know they basically can assist our clients dealing with whatever issues might come up in those areas, but without having to first educate them about you know what the hell the game space is. Um, I'm part of what Pillsbury calls their set team, which is social media, entertainment, and technology. Uh, you know, outside of that, I've. Having my own boutique for years before coming to Pillsbury, I've really dealt with you know, so many different issues. Um, I've written over 30 articles in you know, uh, legal issues, including things like how to get tax incentives in different jurisdictions to make games. Um, and I've given, I don't know, 100 or more lectures at every major game event you know, over the last decade. So um, as Nathan said, I, you know, there, there are definitely, I probably have an answer to any question you guys might have. Of course, because I'm a lawyer, that answer is probably going to be, it depends, um, and which often is the case. I mean, we really need to, you, know, you often need to delve down into the particulars of any issue to really, to really say where things fall. But, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about whatever Nathan and the rest of the group wants to, or I'm also happy to answer questions that, that, that people have. So, Game developer that I've ever talked to, especially every small game developer that's had a relationship with a big publisher, which is like a thing. It's like, oh my God, Electronic Arts call and I got this call. Right. They want to, they all end up hating them. They yeah. all like end up, they're like, I got totally screwed and it was a horrible experience. Yes. Like, is there a way that, like, if they had the right attorney to say, no, I don't Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, actually, th that is part of it. Uh, you know, the, the, problem, the problem with that is, you know, I, I've always said, I gave a lecture once that was why your lawyer should be part of your design team. Um, <laughs> not that I should be coding because that would be horrible, horrible, horrible things. Um, but I can advise companies on like kind of at least the right path to take in some cases when they're thinking of adding new elements of games and whatnot. And some, some of these elements have a lot of legal issues. So, you know, having someone that has, is knowledgeable can help in a lot of different ways. Specifically when you're dealing with publisher agreements, you know, I negotiate with all of the major publishers all the time. Um, and so generally I know what they're going to agree to and what they won't. Um, and so I'll, you know, and, and depending on the publisher, like, you know, a client of mine will come and say, you know, I'm doing a deal with, you know, THQ. Now, they're not really doing a lot of deals at the moment, um, but, you know, go back a couple of years ago when they were, uh, you know, I had certain clients were like, well, we're going to keep all the IP. And I'm like, then don't even bother talking because, you know, it's with them. That's one of their first things is going to say, we own the IP, not you. Uh, so knowing that and knowing uh, what, their, what those publishers are willing to give, um, say in royalty percentages, um, understanding definitions that publishers are going to use on things like net revenues, which can become very much like Hollywood accounting. Uh, you know, you look at these things and you say, oh great, I'm getting 10% you know, of the back end on this game. But you know what, if you're not smart about the way you're designing these things, well that back end is going to include everything under the sun, including you know, the coffee that the executives got you know, on the way to some event, and all of a sudden you're looking at, you're looking at really no, no back end. So I, I always advise clients a lot, you know, especially if they don't have a lot of bargaining power, um, make certain that payment you're getting to develop the game will be profitable for you, if that's all you ever get. You know, is it, is it worth it to you to just build that game for that amount? Uh, so, I mean, definitely having a lawyer that kind of understands it and they can help you kind of develop other aspects of it because some of, the game, some of those game contracts you get um, don't necessarily, you know, are not protective of a developer. They're protective of a publisher. You know, and if, like, yeah. I mean, that's just a given. The question often is like of revenue too, when they make money and why didn't, it's not, I shouldn't have had money because like we sold a lot of games. But I'd say more than that even, it's about like support, like whether they're helping to get it approved, or right. a platform, but mostly marketing, right? And it's like really hard for a developer to have visibility into marketing. Right. And then, so I, it's a two part question. One sort of that, is there a way to negotiate that? And the other is like now in the days of app stores, like, I don't think developers really know what they should be asking for in the way of marketing support or in the way of like, so what is an effective campaign that a developer, and this is kind of like, kind of 
goes with a little bit the publisher, what can you negotiate with the publisher, but also like what should they be trying to look at in the way of a campaign if they can really do a campaign in, in support of this. And I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about a lot of different methods, but um, so I guess it's both. I mean, I'll say from the legal side, then you, I think you're going to be able to talk a lot more about that. But yeah, I mean, you can, you know, we negotiate those sort of things all the time. You know, we put into agreements, you know, this is how much money is going to be spent on marketing and we'll, you know, attach maybe an exhibit that'll go down and talk about in some, at least a floor of these are the elements of marketing that's going to exist for this particular game. And so, at least as a developer, you know, well, I'm going to, you know, there's going to be a website and there's going to be a release party and there's going to be, you know, it's going to be sent out to, you know, all of this particular publishers, um, you know, whether it be PR firm or, you know, it's going to be sent to their connections. And, you know, similar the way you might, you might design like a GDD, you're going to design a marketing campaign. And, you know, at, at, if for no other reason, then you'll know I'm getting at least this level of support on it. But yeah, I mean that you know, I'm the lawyer. My job is just to make sure that exhibit's there. It's not my job to design what's going to be on the exhibit. That's going to be more, you know, someone else's job. Yeah. Uh, I think with the rise of the you know digital publisher, specifically on uh, iOS, you know they'll say, okay, you know you have a game, we'll publish it for you. But because of that, you know, uh, what, you know, what's the point? You publish it yourself. Well, we're going to give you a PR support, marketing support, and uh, we have more muscle with Apple to get you featured on the App Store, right? So it's like, okay, well, what is what is marketing and PR support really? Well, if you're let's say Chilingo put out a dozen games a week, you really think you're going to get that much attention, PR-wise, or are you going to pick one game over yours to really, you know, kind of? push over at Apple to try to actually give it some love. So it is really, really tricky um, because uh, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of specifics because digital publishing is kind of still a little bit wild west in terms of what that actually means. I think most developers view it as I got a better chance of Apple featuring me um, than uh, if I did it independently. And it sort of just boils down to that. On traditional publishing in a box, regular games, the marketing stuff like you, you know, you're saying is hard to get any visibility um, on what people are spending money on or the stuff gets all lumped together. There could be some big spend at Walmart on some end cap or something and all of a sudden it's like there's some, the deals are different with different games and all of a sudden it's like, well, okay, well they have to recoup that. We're going to put that whole expense of that end cap, which is a couple hundred grand on yours. Yeah. And you get screwed. But that's just classic publisher. Because well, you can also have things like yeah. cross collateralization, similar to what you're talking about, where you might have, you know, you might have a game that's being released on a bunch of different platforms and you might have one platform that's just hitting it out of the park and you should be getting a lot of money off that. But because of the way the contract is written, all the expenses from every one of those platforms is going to be deducted before you get see dollar one on even that, you know, so that ends up turning the tables on you and all of a sudden you're not getting any money. Um, so those are other things that, you know, you can, you definitely can put language in there to try to stop that. And also things like, you know, you can't bundle games. You know, if you might have, you know, if you're working with a publisher, they may want to have the right to say, you know what, I'm going to sell your game with 10 other games bundled together and, you know, because we just don't have a lot of faith in it or whatever the case may be. And, you know, all of a sudden, you're, the market for what you have is just plummet. I mean, so it, if you have a relation, if a developer has a relationship, if a publisher wants to distribute and one, wants to distribute like an iOS game, it's kind of like a shot in the dark for the developer, really, because as you say, it's like, um, who knows kind of which of these triggers will work and, and you know. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked that. Yeah. We get approached by, by tons of indie iOS guys yeah. and they're like, what should we do? Should we hire you guys to do PR for us? Should we have, we have Chilingo or whoever talking to us? Should we do deal with them? I don't know what to do. And I, in general, I advise them uh, if they're pretty fresh, you know, pretty new, yeah. to pretty much experiment independently for a while. Um, and kind of make their own call later as opposed to just jumping. I think there is value with the digital publishers these days, but I think you need kind of the right game to do so. Um, and I think you need something you know, pretty original and something that the developer or the publisher gets behind and it's where they're cute. They offer QA, which I think is actually a lot of value for more complex games as well. Um, so I don't know, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's no answer because it is like you know, you're saying, it's just like, it is, nobody really has it figured out. There's no yeah. answer. There's, I don't sit here like as some company people hire to help them promote games saying, yep, here's the solution, boom, you're the next whatever, doodle jump or something, you know, but 
Um, I think the best thing to do from the developer, indie developer point of view is to stay pretty transparent, talk to people, build some relationships, and get some games out there and learn from the kind of school of hard knocks rather than go like, I'm going all in um, my first try and, yeah. and give up everything. I think if you look at AAA games, there's a yeah. proven correlation between marketing spend and sales. Yeah. You can turn the, you can polish the biggest turd with a big <laughs> enough marketing budget. I mean, speaking of THQ, they shipped a game called Homefront that they knew was terrible. I mean, they, they absolutely knew it was abysmal. They told they the shut world. shut the studio down <laughs> right after. <laughs> immediately after. Like, they, they were not unaware. They told the world it was going to, you know, change everything. They hyped it up like crazy. They threw a ton of marketing dollars into it and it sold five million units. Um, forget, I mean, five million units for that game is such, a, such an incredible number, but um, it, with a limited market, I mean, AAA games is limited, there's only so many games that come out a week or a month or a year. Versus iOS, where depending on the numbers you read, it's 100 games a day. So like, the noise there is so high that I think that there's a, I think there's a tendency for a lot of independent developers to get really scared and intimidated. Yeah. Um, and, they, and they want any support they can get. I can tell you from the press side, you go to the company, EA doesn't know how to sell a AAA game, not to mention um, an indie game. Like, you know, EA bought Chilingo, uh, I think in a large part thinking that they were buying Angry Birds, um, which they were not and have not been able to reproduce yet. Um, but those Chilingo games, I mean, they don't reach us very well. Indie developers have a better chance of getting their game covered in the press, I think, in a lot of ways than EA does, just by telling a good story. Reach out to the press and tell them, hey, we're making this game, this is what it's about. Um, don't be annoying. Yeah, don't be annoying. <laughs> like, make a good pitch. And, like, you know, what we'll get from EA sometimes on a, on a let's say on a Chilingo game, we'll get a press release once a week saying, like, hey, we're announcing a new level. Like, in your iOS game. Great. Like, thanks. Delete. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of post forums you can find online about indie developers that have like, you know, launched to very middling sales, realized that they're never going to make it and they're about to pull off and then like the right tweet or the right link on the right website gets it into the top 100 games. And then as soon as it's there and it's on a list somewhere where people can find it, all of a sudden it bubbles up slowly and slowly if it's, it's a good game or not. Um, some of that still has bearing on that marketplace. Um, and you'll get a uh, game to turn to hits. I think Rail Yard, I think is the name of the game, had, a, had an incredible story. The guy um, uh, has now sold a lot of units of that game, but he was you know, probably day away, days away from throwing uh, the towel in. So those kinds of post are really fascinating, and they also illustrate that the kind of chaos of that marketplace, which is, like I said, something that I don't think anyone's really codified yet. Certainly not the big publishers who are investing in heavily and um, are, I think, are really scared by um, how uncontrolled it is. You know, to your point about the nature of those publishing contracts they have with a lot of developers, they they're built for the publisher. But a lot of these publishers are artificially lengthening an old business model uh, for AAA games. Um, which is kind of being undermined constantly. So you have companies like THQ who are very much kind of struggling to stay alive right now to diversify their portfolio into social, they bought Playdom, into mobile, into uh, just about anything uh, that isn't just AAA gaming. They spent $500 million to make an MMO. So. And unfortunately the problem with some of those things is there, you know, you have some of these large, and also some of the large media companies that are involved in gaming. But they're, they're purchasing these companies that have had some success because of the fact that they're nimble and able to do these things. And then these large institutional companies are basically saying, okay guys, now that we've purchased you because you're nimble and take chances, we want you now to do everything our way, which is you know, move at a glacial speed. Um, and then wondering why that investment hasn't been you know, proven as successful as they expected. Or even better with the Chilingo example, you guys caught lightning in a bottle that one time We've got a lot of bottles, <laughs> and we can get all the bottles you guys need. Just keep putting lightning in it, uh, preferably every quarter. Right. <laughs> uh, that'll really make it better for us. Um, and it's a really, you know, I know, it sounds like silly to, to talk about it, but it's a very 
corporate way of looking at it. You know, EA just bought, I harp on EA a lot, because they're really, <laughs> they're really trying the hardest, maybe, for better or worse. Um, they just bought PopCap. PopCap's an independent company who has been making casual games for, I think, about a decade, very successfully. Um, and it very much was a non-corporate type of development. They polished the hell out of games that look really simple. Um, and everyone's really worried about how EA is going to uh, maybe pervert that focus that they have. Where they make a game like Peggle, which is basically like Pachinko with unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> also, it seems stupid, but when you play it, it's, it's very... They're like the blizzard of casual games, right? They just iterate and refine. Um, I'm waiting for Madden Bejeweled. Uh, we've, got, we've got Madden for Facebook, so they, they'll get there, I'm sure. Um, so... Uh, and I didn't even think about it. They probably are going to do that. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Um, so the, you know, the question is, how are they going to uh, change PopCap's culture? Uh, but PopCap is an example of a casual company that did a great job getting its games out there and its brand out there, not only for making good games, before there was digital marketplaces. I mean, they were putting their games all over the web, selling them themselves, um, but also getting their games out there with core gamers. It's like, you got core gamers to talk about, you know, Bejeweled, like how did you do that? How did you get core gamers to talk about Peggle? Some of it's making good games, and some of it's just like talking to us and going after us. I mean, you know, they themselves kind of built up the, I mean, they had the money for starters, but they built up the know-how. Um, so, yeah, I, I I tend to be distrustful of the big publishers um, <laughs> professing any kind of, uh, you know intimate knowledge in the digital spaces because the same arcane knowledge that they have in retail is meaningless in the digital retail space. So, following up on something you said earlier, you said if they sent, you know, you're talking about like how they message you as a, as a journalist and as an editor um, and how they do it badly, how do they do it well do you look at like what percentage of games that like just independent developers send to your either this organization or compared to you know, Joystick or like how many actually get looked at possibly for review? How many like do you just read the description like oh, that's not I don't know. <laughs> or like how does that work and how do people effectively message you? What's a, what's a good message to an editor to get them interested in the game? And what is the email address? <laughs> <laughs> The email address for us is tips at polygon.com. Easy enough. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, one of the things that I always hear that's crazy, and we'll, we'll hear this from, the, from big publishers. Sorry, we didn't know how to get a hold of you. A kid in Brazil sent me a picture of a potato chip that looked like Pac-Man this morning. They thought, asked if we wanted to run a post. Like, he got a hold of me. He doesn't speak English. <laughs> and you guys have, like, what, an $8 billion market cap and you can't get a hold of me? Like, there's something fundamentally wrong with your organization. Um, that was somebody at EA, by the way. We'll just keep on the EA train all day. Just make certain that everyone gets it right. He's the one that's bashing EA. <laughs> <laughs> um, you wouldn't even know who to tell at EA. So, uh, so um, you know, it's, it's a, what's the right messaging? Part of it, I think, is reach out, period, at all, ever, which a lot of people just don't do. Um, you'd think it would be noisier for us, which is like, yeah. I mean, as big, uh, as damning as I can get. Um, if you just spent three years publishing an indie game and you didn't at least take the time to go through the top 30 video game outlets in America and send them a short email. I can like, speak to that a little bit. I mean, people hit us sometimes. And they're like, well, there's, you know, we'd love to get coverage on Polygon or Joystick or whatever. I'm like, did you email them? No, no. I don't, you know, we don't want to make them mad or something. Like, they're just people. Like, just email them. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you have something cool, just fire them a note. They may respond. They may not. Yeah, send me a drive on Twitter. Send me a, some people know. are shocked to hear that, as if you guys are like these gods on some mountain that will be. In, I, I'm going to humiliate them. How dare they email me? Because I only get the latest, biggest. You know, it's just. Fire them an email. Does it need to be a hook in it for editors most of the time? Do you send it to the head editor or like a writer that you like? Or you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like sending the big long, like we do this and this and this and this, and send them a long email. My experience is people are usually like, 
No. Yeah, we're glazed over. It's just super, like, super quick. And then I think on the personal side, like meeting face to face and stuff like that, and people getting their hands on the game, people up into them, which is even easier these days. You know, you can just be like, oh, I got this, boom. You know, yeah. whether it's at a PAX or yeah. whatever. All, all that stuff is, is, is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's not that hard to track these guys down, and they're all over. They're, I mean, the Polygon guys are kind of weirdly based on the East Coast, but it's, um, they're all over. You know, typically there's somebody within a driving distance that that writes for, um, you know, even what is, I, mean, I think Ben Kuchera at Penny Arcade or the ARS. He's in Cincinnati. He's in Cincinnati, so it's like you can find people, you know, and they're typically people friendly. in Chicago and Austin yeah. and, uh, and in Wisconsin or um, in uh, Minnesota, you know, game informer guys like, yeah. you know, the thing is like. You also have YouTube. I mean, you know, you can put a video up on YouTube and get you know the right video, the right person. I mean, you're talking about again lightning in a bottle, but you have all these opportunities available, um, which are really unique. I mean, one of the things that we usually recommend to somebody is like f find a hook. Like, what is your what makes your game special? Is it literally like hey, you know, one of the games that we just featured on Polygon last week and did a review of and talked about is called uh, Spell Sword for iOS, which is fun. Um, it's very much like Super Crate Box. It looks a lot like it. Um, you can very much tell that they're influenced from it, but it plays much differently. And if they were to send us an email like, hey, we know you guys like Super Crate Box. We made a game that kind of looks like it, but we do a lot of cool things. Here's a video. I two sentences. You know who would watch that video? Everybody on my team. Like all of us. We'd all be like, hmm, let's check it out. That looks pretty cool. It's a dollar. I'll try it. I mean, you know, it's not difficult to like pique someone's interest. And I also understand, I mean, I've met a lot of developers, not all of them think that way. Um, a lot of them are very much the engineer, and they, they don't maybe make those connections. That's where uh, you come in, right? But like, the ability to just reach out to somebody is, um, it's free and open to all. Um, and it's something that the biggest publishers, a lot of times, I mean, you know, if you think chill, if you think getting a deal with Chilingo means there's an email in my inbox, you are mistaken. <laughs> um, you know, like that, uh, the, the biggest publishers, well, let's not get into how bad AAA <laughs> publisher uh, PR is, but um, you know, I, I think that that's one of the things that's exciting to me is that the disruptive nature of the digital marketplaces is because all this stuff becomes unnecessary, maybe except for lawyers. Um, but we're never unnecessary. No, no. <laughs> Uh, but you have this opportunity to kind of like do a lot of things yourself um, and, uh, and sidestep stuff. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the risk of failure is still there. Um, just like it is in the, in the AAA space, but at least it's your own failure, right? It's not, if you send the team an email, yeah, don't send me yeah. emails, I'm, I'm terrible. But if you send the, uh, the team an email, we've got processes, it gets vetted, it goes through, you know, um, and that's the way it works in most of the outlets, right? There, there's processes to deal with that, 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 uh, that flow. Yeah. Well, one, one, one good bit of advice is specifically to do with uh, whatever iOS and Android stuff is, um, you know, I, Eli Hodap is editor-in-chief of Touch Arcade, right? And he's just like, I just poke around on forums, the Touch Arcade forums, and see what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that kind of helps me sort of decide what I want to check out or I want to kick down to the other writers to make sure they review or so stuff like that. So since, friends. you know, get in there and, and, and communicate, start posting some stuff, some information, <coughs> you never know. I mean, it, it can really uh, can garner some interest from those ultra hardcore people sitting there. Is there like a skeleton of a standard rollout that you suggest for iOS? Or kind of. I mean, I always say to launch an iOS game, you doing PR to Apple is more important than almost PR, the PR you try to get yeah. the faces consumers. It's, there's not that much like, I got coverage, my game's out, I got coverage, and it's just like, boom, I'm selling a ton. But like, if you get some coverage before the game comes out, and I, my theory, Apple's always kind of opaque. You never really quite know, but you know, you're kind of like, okay, we have some stuff going on, there's some interesting stuff posting before this game comes out. I think some people pay attention to it, and it increases at least your likelihood of being featured by Apple in those first maybe two or three weeks that you're that you're out, and that's completely the holy grail, right? You're never—it's very rare, I think, for any 
iOS game to really sell without getting Apple support in its early stages right. these days. So I, I've gotten that off. So many of my clients yeah. have been that way. They've been like, what do we need to do to get featured on an Apple? And I'm like, my yeah, I'm like, I'm like don't talk to me. <laughs> I know Apple has an editorial team uh, yeah. made up of former games industry guys. I mean, yeah. Matt Casting Messina from IGN is over there along with a handful of other IGN people, former IGN people. Um, best I can tell, those, those placements are all done by human beings, obviously. Um, I think they read the touch arcades and IGNs and polygons of the world, and like if they see buzz for a game, if they see good reviews for a game, if they see a name they recognize, if you happen to be like a, I don't know, let's say a, a more successful or well-known indie developer, like a 2D boy, you know, it was a year and a half maybe after World of Goo came out on, uh, it first came out on Wii, then it came out on Steam. And then they finally released it on iOS like a while after, but it had a name that people recognized, and uh, that quickly became their highest grossing platform by a long shot. Because um, Apple featured it very prominently. And I think like the assumption I make is that that team at Apple is, is reading the forums and they're reading the sites. So getting a couple links might seem like nothing. There might not be any comments on it, but like those guys at Apple aren't reading about the new Call of Duty. They're specifically looking for iOS games that people are talking about that have some even small amount of interest in them. To, to keep on the, the EA thread, I remember a number of years ago, <coughs> like in early 2000s, they were um, kind of doing their first uh, mobile applications. And I met with them and they said, yeah, we're going to meet Verizon in a couple of days and we're going to show them Madden on this and they're going to give us whatever we want. Effectively, I said, you know, I said, you know Verizon, they just don't care. They'll just put whatever they want there, and it'll, you know, it's, it's kind of like they think that whatever's top in the deck is going to sell anyway, so they may as well put something in there. And they called back a couple weeks and said, yeah, Verizon really didn't care. And I mean, so my question is, does Apple care about the major publishers? I mean, there's kind of a perception they do, but like, or are there other brands? Like, what do you think there are brands that really make a difference with Apple, or does that, is Apple just like, I mean, I know IGN's kind of voice, if it's kind of com coming from a lot of IGN editors and that sort of thing is, you know, sort of smart as, I, I can't imagine them saying, yeah, you were going to go with EA because it's EA, and so, how uh, do you think? I think a big IP is li still likely to, if it's native to the platform, if it's from a big publisher, or it's a big property, I think Apple's more likely to pay attention. I mean, Sega just put out, what, to a Total War on, on iPad, you know, which I think is a pretty good yeah. game, and um, it's been featured pretty heavily, and if that thing had come out of nowhere, who knows? I don't know. I think the fact that it's a Sega games and no property pretty much guaranteed it some coverage just because it was developed. It wasn't just important. You know? Well, it's also it's also a point of you know when, when you get to companies like Sega and, uh, and others of, of that size, they have bargaining power with with them. <coughs> Maybe not you know complete, mm -hmm. but at least you know they can make these deals with them and they can you know they, they might contract with one of these companies to say well you know you guys you know we, we want to be featured in some way and you know then this is what's going to be done. You know, that's not that's not the same type of bargaining power. Someone even if even if they've had a couple successful um, iOS games is really going to have because you know Apple might be like, hey Sega, we don't really care about this game, but you know what? Later down the line, we may want to you know do some work with you on something else. And so they you know those, those sort of things, you know, everybody knows each other when you get to a certain level. It makes it a lot easier for those deals to happen. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like. What? No, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. And like, you know, that, that, it's not going to help you on that front. Um, you know, but you know, it, it's it, it is possible when you get to certain of those levels for those things to happen. So, I mean, because of the, because of being more on the indie and the, the startup phases, you, you have to look at what you know. You have to look at what bargaining power you have, and in some cases, that bargaining power, is, as as these guys were saying, it, it's you know, contacting these these you know other publications out there that you know, and giving them a story to tell. I mean, I. I know whenever I've written something and I wanted coverage of it, you know, when I contacted the media, I didn't contact the media being like, you know, how wonderful I am. I contacted the media with like, hey, here's an idea for a story and here's like some backup stuff that we've done. And I found a lot more success in getting something like that picked up than, you know, can you write an article patting me on the back because I'm such a great guy. You know, I think, you know, to your point in your presentation, I think the things that are changing now is that the media, I, I mean, I'd say for Polygon specifically are very much our, our stated intent, but I think other outlets too are looking for different types of games. Like that's one of the things that this, you know, the idea of digital distribution has changed. 
you're seeing games like, you know, let's look at like the kind of big classic indies at this point, like Braid. Games like that resonate with games writers because they are saying something to them that other games don't. You know, we wrote, you know, uh, some of the games we're talking about reminded me a lot of uh, Johann Sebastian Joust. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we wrote uh, like a 3,500 word feature on that game. Uh, <laughs> really had a lot of pictures yeah. and stuff. <laughs> so we wrote this huge feature in this game with like, an, you know, interview with the creators of the game and all the people, the people who had played it for the, 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 the group that first played it when he you know, introduced it. That's a game that doesn't even have a video screen. You know, you can buy it. It's not even for sale uh, if you wanted it. Um, well, we should definitely bring it to iOS because it would be perfect with the phones. Anyway, people are looking to tell stories that are interesting, that do things that are different. And if your game does something different, like, that's an angle. You know, it, you know, from the kind of crass journalistic side, that's a headline. You know, if you can make a headline that somebody's going to be like, I'd read that, um, they'll click on it. And uh, you know, if your game is like, hey, it's an infinite runner with zombies in it and also vamp, like, there's, out of those 100 games that come out a day on iOS, probably about 80 of them are that game, uh, just over and over and over again. Uh, but if it's something different, um, and you can explain why it's different, um, there's press waiting to be you know, given to you. Um, and and uh, I'm always kind of baffled that the indies have, you know, we'll find indie games on our own that we'll, we'll you know, dig out and find it in the forum or a video. And we'll contact them and say, hey, we want to talk to you about your game, crickets. <laughs> we'll reach out again and say, like, hey, like, it would be, be cool if we could like, maybe like, do an interview or something. No? No response? OK, great. Um, that's weird. So some of it's, you know, it seems like silly advice, but email people, like answer emails. I'll give you advice that he'll hate, too. Get on IM with people. You meet them, find out their IM is, and they're way less likely to ignore you. I and will ignore he, your IM. <laughs> he, he'll hate me saying that, but like with certain people, like after you get to know them on IM, a thousand times better than, than email or the phone. I would don't, say don't hate me for saying it because you know it's true. I would <laughs> say Twitter. If you get on Twitter, yeah. you can kind of talk back to people. I'll see people on Twitter that I've talked to off and on mm -hmm. for six months. And then all of a sudden, that same person sends me a message and says, like, hey, my game's about to go to the App Store. Can I send you a code? I'm like, I don't even know you made games. Like, I just like, you're a dude on Twitter. Sure. Um, like, you know, yeah, you've made an investment in that relationship. That's, you know, I don't know, maybe it's manipulative, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You're talking about, you know, having that bargaining chip. But I, I don't know. Again, it's, a, it's so opaque. I don't know where that extends. If you look at the other, I would say the other big successful digital distribution service right now, Steam, I don't think Xbox, Xbox Live Indie Games has never been anything. Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network are both, I think, well actually I don't think, I know that sales on both of those platforms are dropping. Um, and, uh, and there's a handful of kind of core games that continue to make up the bulk of purchases on that, but there's a lot of games that just fail on those platforms. Nintendo's digital platforms have always failed. They've not had any real successes to date. Do you like anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, like I think Apple's doing a great job. I think Apple's, um, without trying in a way, uh, and with being, uh, doing a lot of things that are really inscrutable, Apple's changing the industry in a way that the industry kind of doesn't understand. You know, I agree. Microsoft, um, I went on NPR in 2006, 2007 maybe, to talk about the YouTube of games is what there was, that was there. Um, headline for it. Uh, is it a headline on radio? I don't know. Anyway, um, and, uh, and what we were talking about then was, um, this must have been 2006 because it was before the App Store launch. Uh, we were talking about uh, Xbox Live Indie Games. It was community games back then. Um, they had just announced it. It was like a year away, but they were talking about it. And it was exciting. This idea, you know, you can make your own games, put them up on a store, people can buy them. And this was the first time we'd ever heard of something. It was like, this, could, this is a game changer. This could be huge. And of course, it never got huge. It's been a huge failure. Um, but the idea of it was so exciting. Of course, the real YouTube of games ended up being the App Store. Uh, and this was Apple who didn't try. They didn't show off games at first. It wasn't even like Solitaire comes free. It was like you get a calendar and you get, you know. It wasn't, that wasn't their goal at all. And it's, in a lot of ways, it, 
it strangely still isn't. Everyone, the big question in the game space now is, will that change now that Steve Jobs is dead, who always had a kind of professed, almost dislike of games. Um, Although he was one of the original creators of things like... Made Asteroids. Yeah. So, and uh, Breakout as well. Yeah, so he... Uh, yeah, Breakout, excuse me. Uh, he, um, you know, it, it's, so it's strange to, to think about what if Apple actually tried harder? Uh, right now it seems like it's all, you know, um, it's almost for free. But so the other big success right now though is Steam. Um, and the big question that I think a lot of devs have is how on earth do you get on Steam? Because Valve doesn't care if you're a AAA publisher or not. Uh, they don't care if you're successful and have had other hits in the past or not. You could be the smallest indie dev and if somebody in Bellevue sees your game and says, huh, that seems neat, we'll put it on Steam. Um, it, it's funny, I, I, I completely agree with you. I have, I've got a situation right now where, you know, someone that I know is kind of going through that and, you know, they actually have a, a um, PC-based game that they want to get on there, which is a little more difficult for them, for, for them to get on that platform to begin with. But, you know, I know, like, the general counsel there and, and whatnot, and even I can't get an answer from, <laughs> from him on it. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I just want to know who, to, who this guy should talk to. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any... There's no rules. It's just kind of like, well, put it up. I mean, um, yeah, even larger games, like uh, there's a game that came out recently by uh, Demiurge in Boston called Shoot Many Robots, published by Ubisoft. Demiurge has been doing work in the industry for over a decade. Ubisoft is huge. The game came out on Xbox Africa and PlayStation Network, and they couldn't get it on Steam. And it wasn't that they, wasn't that, they couldn't, that they could not get it on, they just weren't getting answers or responses or contracts or whatever, and it was like, How's that possible? Like, like, of course Steam would put your game on there. They put on games that are a quarter of that size, or that visibility. I, Jamestown, local Philadelphia game by Final Form, uh, got on Steam, and uh, I think it had a lot of success there. Um, I think Steam, the way Xbox Live Arcade used to be three years ago, is becoming a kingmaker, because hits on Steam are becoming huge. And Steam's ability to put things on sale and really drive kind of repeat business and catalog business is Doing things Amazon won't do in terms of price changing, right? Yeah, yeah, and like, yeah, Amazon's interesting. I mean, well, that's a different discussion. Amazon's got its own game store now for Android, but you know, you're seeing all these kinds of these digital marketplaces shifting, but nobody has any of the answers. You know, like he's been working in the business representing companies for you know how long? Like a decade. A decade. Yeah. So, and then how do you get a game on Steam? I don't know. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much a wild west, um, and the biggest publishers don't know how to do it, but then a small studio in Philadelphia um, gets on there and is ahead. I have to say, in, in all reality, some of that is what keeps me in the space and interested because of the fact that it hasn't been so formulaic at this point. You know, this stuff is still interesting. I mean, you know, there's still questions coming up that people ask me, and I'm like, fuck do I know? Like, you know, I'm like, let's go try to figure it out. Like, you know. I have, an, I have a question. I know the answer to, but uh, <laughs> let's get various takes on. So, uh, GameStop recently bought a very small competitor of Steam, and going to change their model, I guess. So they're selling kind of day. Oh, uh, never mind, because you guys take advertising stuff. So, <laughs> does anybody have a thought on on like kind of where that positions and what do you think the future of the, the GameStop new digital distribution initiative is? I think they're. I think they're. Running, running scared. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they're, they've really made a dent with it. I think you'd probably find some publishers that have a PC skew would just not put it in a box, maybe offer it to them exclusively to help them buy more of the console versions. You maybe see some of that stuff. But I don't think we've seen that yet, though. It just seems, like, seems, the like, only, strategy, it seems like the only thing that yeah. would make any sense. I mean, why would anybody... Well, even that's actually difficult on a legal perspective because it's Is what's it? called tying. When you're basically like you will only give one product with as long as something else is being de dealt with a different way. Actually, there can be legal, you know, there are antitrust issues with things like that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Not to say I, it I happen, can't really think of a big uh, downloadable success story on with, on GameStop's platform or whatever. I, I don't. I don't really know um, how they'll survive. To be honest. Well, there's there's always going to be people that want a box. But the, but the, the question that, is: the question is, do they, you know, are, are they are there that many of them 
that are you know that that can keep a company like GameStop going from you know the brick and mortar perspective. I mean, we've seen every we've seen every every business model that that has done that sort of thing fail once technology has come to you know make it easier to get things immediately. So the thing about it, as a retailer though, and I mean I have some background with re game retail, and um, you have to grow, and I don't see the physicals like GameStop's growing. So it's like, you know, they have to grow or die. Right. They can't, it can't just be like, oh, we sell the same number of Madden. Well, they've and, actually I mean, had a lot of success kind of selling digital accessories yeah. in store. That's what yeah. they're doing. Cars yeah, they're definitely focusing on that. Yeah. And, and it's been yeah. a big hit. They just announced a big deal with Blizzard. Uh, you can buy Diablo 3 digitally in the store and download it through Battle.net. And you can also buy Diablo 3 items in the store. Diablo 3 is going to have this big auction house. And it's like, well, they're going to have lots that you can buy in the game, too, through the store. So, I mean, it's like, how much more does it get you doing it through retail? But think, also, when they first announced yeah. this, I think everyone said, like, go on, if you're already going home to download it, like, just download it on the internet. Like, why would you? But people are doing it. And part, so some of the reasons people are doing it, it's cash. So it's kids that don't have a credit card. So they can go to a store and buy Diablo 3 in cash and then download it, um, which, you know, is a... Is a <coughs> Seems like a strange use scenario. I mean, like, don't kids have, they have iPhones, like you don't have a debit card, or I, I guess not. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's, it's moving their needle. Like, they yeah, are posting yeah. huge um, numbers on, on these digital purchases. I mean, they've had that same issue with WoW for, for a number of years. For a while, they looked at, like, kind of whether they could just go online, and they did see that their initial, they were getting their, their new client uptake through physical stores. So it does make sense. I mean, my, my question is just kind of like, I don't think they're bringing in a whole lot of new people for that into the stores. I don't think their numbers are going to grow based on that unless they change. I mean, they're a business model that's based on uh, logistics, like super efficient logistics, yep. getting product out to the stores fast, and super low store costs. Well, and not paying the new store. Games. So yeah, the new, the new games, platform, so like half their money is off these games. So if the new platforms come out and those legitimate, they legitimately work with the publishers to fight the used games thing, like however they want to do it. VIP passes, is, right. who knows what they'll do beyond the VIP passes. Or, but um, ultimately, ultimately that, I think GameStop is truly screwed. Yeah, but ultimately that, you know, yeah. the used game market's never going to be killed, even even with those VIP passes. I mean, because what's going to happen, basically, in the, in the long run is, you know, the, the publishers are happy to get more money. If they can sell a game 50 times and get more money out of it, they're happy to do it. They don't want to sell the game once and then have GameStop selling it 50 times and getting all the money out of it. So, yeah, they're going to do things with the VIP passes or initially, you know, if it gets to the point where that secondary market's going to kill GameStop, well, then GameStop will start negotiating with the publishers and come up with ways to, you know, to mon you know, mon monetarily incentivize the publishers to allow some of those resales. Because, you know, hey, it's free money for them. One of the big questions now is whether or not the next generation of consoles will actually lock out used games. Yeah. And there's rumors saying that they will yeah. um, because it's, it's such a, again, hits-driven business. Yeah. And um, the games are getting increasingly expensive to, to make. And this idea that a retailer is uh, chewing up all these repeat profits. And, and, you know, most people accept in a software industry, accept that you can't trade the software that you purchase, or you can't give it away. If you buy a copy of Microsoft Office, like... Well, again, it all, depend, it, all depend, it all depends what your, your end user licensing agreement says on that. <laughs> there's been some, there's case law on that now about whether or not you can resell these things and whether it's infringing and everything like that. And, you know, most of the time, if you have a properly drafted end user licensing agreement with that game, you're covered, but in certain cases, there have been software that wasn't covered properly by a by a, a good end user licensing agreement, and the courts have found. Well, Oops. there's what's called the first sale doctrine under copyright law, which means you have the right to control the first sale of that book, but you can't then say well, you can't resell that book. It's you know you can't copy that book. That's a different story, but you can't then that physical item. You can't stop it from being sold again and again and again. Um, but software is technically esoteric and you don't own it you know you 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 don't sell a disc you basically sell the physical piece but it's really just that like you're giving someone a license to use that piece of code and as long as you have restrictions within that license that's how you can stop the right. the resale and you know and so i guess the same questions for steam as kind of we were looking at for ios like what kind of is is it how is it the same and how is it different i guess in all perspectives and in, in, in 
marking, get kind of marketing, is it the same? You think? And <coughs> well, iOS versus Steam? Yeah, yeah, I mean, just as a marketplace. Yeah, not I mean, as, the, the, the Steam crowd is so much more hardcore, right? I, it, iOS is largely impulse purchases, yeah. um, and then the Steam stuff is these PC guys that are hugely informed and, and pretty, you know, sophisticated. So, speaking from purely a, what I would say, publicity or promotional point of view, the PR would matter a hell of a lot more um, for, a, for a game that would ultimately get put on Steam um, and you know, doing the community stuff at, at a PAX or even to some of these lower key events or, or whatever um, can, can, really, can really, really help. I think it's some credibility. And then, I, like I said, on the iOS side, your goal is really to hopefully increase your chances to get an Apple if you choose. I think that uh, it's, it's a little different. I just think that the Steam crowd is simply more hardcore. So with Steam, you're talking to the to the buyers, and with iOS, you're first talk you're talking to the buyers, but also to Apple, right? Yeah, so. I, th I mean, there's similarities, but I, st I just think that the people who play games on their PC um, are, I don't know, they're, they're more sort of community minded and more inclined to, sh to talk to each other about it and do stuff like that. Where they're definitely um, engaged. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, it's, it's just a different beast. Really is. It's kind of most of the Steam guys I found they're buying that game regardless. You know, it's yeah. not they're not coming across it when they're look when they're searching for things. They're they're buying it. So if for they right. can't get it on Steam, they're going to buy it in the store. I mean, yeah, you know. I think with, uh, like on iOS, I think people browse like, mm -hmm. what's going on here? Maybe I'll try this game. Maybe we'll get a demo of it. You know, on Steam, I think it's very much a um, more of a proactive approach. Like I, I know this game is on there and it comes out today, and I will go purchase it then. Um, you know, I think one of the differences that Steam and iOS provide that um, some other platforms don't, which is a, a sense of permanence. You know, like, like this is tied to your Steam account. You get a new computer, you, all your games are there. You get a new iPhone, all your games are there. You get an iPad, if it's a universal app, like it's already on your iPad. And that idea, I think, helps people a lot, which I, I think consumers are getting more used to, which again is putting a ruffle in the, uh, the retail model. That's because you brought it up. I mean, going from like, I bought that game, uh, Hellgate London. Sorry. Like, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it didn't last very long. And like, sometimes I'll buy a game and then not actually play it for a couple months. So I was like, actually, pretty screwed at that. So, um. It, it only lasted a couple months. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like I played it for like a week and then all of a sudden they were like, we're, we're shutting down. But, um. Just, just to think like an apocalyptic view or like a prognostication type thing. What happens if Steam goes under? Like, if, if Valve just, like, went through some sort of crisis and they died? I think Valve's already said that they would unlock the DRM on Steam. Uh, so basically, if they go under, it's like... So you just cool. open it up. Just, good. Yeah, like the games you bought are you now doing it all. <laughs> um, but that's, you know... Unlikely. Yeah, Steam's also... Steam's worth a lot. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> unlikely also just for, you know, unlocking the DRM. I mean... The pen side, they mean unlocking the DRM. Yeah. You know, meaning meaning that you know, if you own it, you can play your own game. That's fine. But I think they mean that it would no longer need to authenticate against exactly. Steam. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I mean, that, that that's that, that's less of a problem if they just completely tried to remove the DRM on any of it. Then uh, yeah. the they publishers would games. never do that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Chris, in terms of scales and marketplaces, I mean, that includes Steam, iOS, and um, is Android. With Android, people never seem very happy with that. It doesn't seem like it's a very effective marketplace. It's very frustrating. I mean, like, iOS is kind of frustrating, but, but Android just seems like people throw this stuff out there. Windows apps, like mobile apps, you know, it's very small, install based. But, like, what other, are there other marketplaces? Like, Gamefly has been pushing somewhat their digital distribution. Like, what, uh, do you know what marketplaces mean something? I mean, you're not buying your games on the Nook? Yeah, okay. So, Gamefly yeah, has a, it's a rental service, so they've got, they bought Direct to Drive from IGN, and so it's like free PC game. Yeah, and, but, uh, more casual stuff, I guess. Uh, no, they have a lot of hard games there, too, it, but it's, it's part of that subscription. So if you have Gamefly, it's a subscription service, you get access to all the PC games. It's kind of an all-you-can-eat model. Um, in terms of other um, marketplaces, I mean, Impulse, which is what GameStop bought, um, had some success with certain types of games, RTS games, et cetera. And if you were gonna, I don't know if that, if that RTS impulse audience moved over to GameStop impulse, or whatever they call it now, probably not. Um, there's some indie um, 
uh, I think it's one called Desura. Uh, I don't think they're hugely successful, but it's a way, if your goal is to get some attention from that community, indie community, there are some marketplaces that you can go to that are very niche, um, that probably only go on money to get you some attention. Um, so really you just want Steam or iOS, and it's kind of like right into the There's <laughs> Android, which does have proven success models. Uh, Android has a larger install base than iPhone. Uh, not iOS as a total ecosystem with iPod touches and uh, uh, iPads, but certainly for phones, Android's bigger. The problem with Android is that there's no consistent benchmark for the phones, so it's hard to develop on, um, and developers spend a lot more money building Android games than they spend building iOS games, which they don't like. Um, there's a lot less visibility of the marketplace, meaning a lot of Android owners don't know that there's a marketplace on their phone, um, and they don't use it. The marketplace itself is somewhat dysfunctional. Uh, that, you know, it seems like almost monthly there's, I don't know, uh, a complete clone, as in the logo, name, company name, and everything um, of iOS games showing up on the Android marketplace with the same description. You buy it for a dollar, and then it just it crashes. So you think, oh, my phone won't run it or something. Nope, that game never came out for Android. That's just a scam and Google doesn't do much about it. And good luck getting your money back. Like, See, personally, as a lawyer, I like that. I mean, that just means my kids get to go to college because there's always going to be work. So there's some weird stuff with Android and Google has not done. A former writer of mine actually just took a job as a senior development liaison with Google's new Play team, which is the name of their marketplace now. Their marketplace, by the way, is for, for music, movies, books, apps, not necessarily games, it's called Play. Yeah. So that's Good branding, Google, you nailed it. Um, so she's there trying to convince developers that Android isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, and developers so far, I think, have given her the following response. Yeah. <laughs> Prove it. And it's just too fragmented to, to make sense, I think, for a lot of developers. In terms of either Steam or iOS, like, do you, working with independent development teams, like, who they approach you, they ask you questions, like, is there does does sandbox? Is there an element of what you do at Sandbox that you say these are the things that we do? And like, could you tell me like kind of the elements well, that you think you, that as opposed to them doing things themselves and we, strike contact? Uh, the super indie guys who are really scrappy or or or, or whatever, like we, we normally just advise them and give them some basic advice to do, to try to go out there and do it themselves. So they don't waste their money. They're way better off putting their money into more content or polishing their game or or, or, or whatever. We're kind of, for most people, developers or whatever, who are farther down the road a little bit. Um, but now and again, we do kind of like, I don't know, have a soft spot. There's something really kind of like crazy to where we're kind of like, we'll, you know, maybe do it for free or, or do something, you know what I mean? Because we just like the people or like the game or whatever. But, but typically, I mean, the, the, the basics of publicity, especially in this space, it's not necessarily brain surgery, it's just putting in the time. And, yeah. and we usually are um, helping people out when they, there's just, when they have the resources and there's just simply no way they have the time to do it right. Do you think there's an arc of effective content before a game is released? So if you're working on a game, you say, okay, next year we're gonna be done in April, a year away. Oh, like what do we do? I, I don't, I don't tell anybody on the iOS side to start their publicity more than six weeks before the game. Okay, so like six weeks prep before, yeah, a little bit, okay. try to have some coverage in that kind of four to six week run up. I don't think you can, for very few games, can you really... Because it's over, it's like, yeah. oh, you know, these yeah, big this console is all, games yeah. <laughs> kick off with a Game Informer cover two years out. I'm like, trying to do that. <laughs> it's not even applicable. Um, but, you know, there's some there's well, some more interesting stuff. I mean, we worked with Remedy on, on Death Rally, which is a very popular iPhone and iPad game. And what they did, which I thought was very clever, and I only made a good game, and it used to be a PC game in the late 90s, but I don't even think that many people knew about it, um, who bought it. Um, but they built it to where it was like 20% of basically the whole game was in that initial launch. And then they built it so every single update was not just like whatever little new level was. They put up these big meaty proper updates with all sorts of stuff. Oh, and then we planned ahead with them publicity wise to have the assets and tell the story and this and that. And they were very open with numbers throughout the whole thing. So, that lasted over over a year with them putting out really great content for Death Rally, and they got featured repeatedly by Apple. They posted really great sales numbers 
um, they kind of just knocked it out of the park. But. That seems great too if you develop that strategy and then you know you have another version of the game come along and you, like right after that so someone has been okay I know I'm, I keep getting new content and then you're like oh the next new one came out and let's keep getting. It. That's There's the really catch cool. on that. The catch mm -hmm. is to not release a game that feels unfinished. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, Remedy's maybe not the best example. They're a pretty veteran developer, and they really do know what they're doing, largely. But uh, um, I mean, I, So I, Remedy, if you don't know, made uh, Alan Wake. They made yeah. the Max Payne games. So they're, yeah. this is an example of a AAA developer dipping its toe into the well, iOS waters. But they're, well, they they, they're interesting to watch, though, because they are, the way they're experimenting in digital, I think, is as smart as anybody. I mean, Death Rally's done well. You know, and they, they spun off Alan Wake into an XBLA game that, that, that did well. Um, but they have the rights into it too as well. Yeah, and they kept the IP for Alan Wake, even though Microsoft published the first one. So they, and they, they have all sorts of, you know, creative kind of things they're, they're doing in digital, but still, like, you know, I'm sure they'll make more AAA stuff on a, on, on a disc too, you know. Uh, I, I think the, the fear that, you know, on the press side that we have is knowing that, um, Regular updates is a model to get re-promoted by Apple, re-featured by Apple. It's a model to get more reviews for your game. Uh, to kind of every update counts as a new point release, counts as more reviews. It keeps the, I mean, there's all these like little psychological things. When you update your apps and you see that game in there, you're reminded that you have that game. You see it and you read a little more about it. It's a constant sort of marking that they can do to you. As you do it, you also feel like you're getting something for nothing. These updates are almost always free. Yeah. Um, well, especially the app updates are free. But uh, so the catch there is that a lot of games. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of a company called Ng Moco, who got bought by a Japanese publisher called DNA. Ng Moco was founded by former EA guy Neil Young, um, and they they made a couple good games at first, and we were like, oh, cool, like an, an iOS publisher making games, like real games, like you know, handheld replacement games. Um, they didn't make any money. So then their new model basically came, let's publish a game as soon as we can. Basically, we've got a name of a game, publish it. And then if it, if it sells at all, we'll add you know, a menu screen. It wasn't that bad, <laughs> but it was almost that bad. Um, and that's their model today, and it works. It makes them a lot of money. But they it got means sold for a lot of money. They got, well, yes, that is more specific. I sold for a lot of money to DNA. But their games are the shittiest. And like pretty much you know if NG Moko's name's on it, like it won't even be a game. It's gonna be like the barest thread of a game. And that maybe if it, they're all free on the one hand, but like it's, you know, get this free game. Hey, you want it to do more stuff? Get this update in the app. Um, and then maybe if enough people buy that, then we'll actually make like more games. So it's a very tricky model, and I think Remedy handled it really well. Rovio does it incredibly with Angry Birds. Uh, Angry Birds Space has. Um, I think it's the fastest selling app today. No, it's actually a really good game. Yeah. Um, and they have physics. A, yeah, I, I mean, they did a, an amazing job of knitting together uh, the simple, accessible gameplay of Angry Birds and like more complicated gameplay that would make an actual gamer have more fun. But um, they just put out a huge update for that. Again, for a game that's a dollar, that's really good. Uh, massive update. So <coughs> for, for that marketplace um, specifically, uh, Steam too, to some degree. Um, updates is a huge part of the marketing. It's a huge way to, if you make a relationship in the press and you have a big update, you can go back to the, those press contacts and say, hey, you know, we have a big new update. We want to talk to you about it. it sounds but, like you kind of like it and kind of hate it, right? <laughs> if, if it's done well. It's done poorly nine out of ten times. Like, does it raise a red flag for you when you see it? Or does it, is it kind of like neutral and then you wait to be annoyed? Or? It depends on the company. It depends on what they're doing. Like Remedy with, with Death Rock, we wouldn't cover it a lot, depending on what they did, but they were adding like really meaningful content. And that, that's the catch, right? It's like you have to, it can't just be, you know, to your point, it can't be like, oh, we added a new background color. Yeah, that's Nobody yeah. cares. You know? Well, um, I mean, that, that goes into the selling model, too, because, I mean, you know, so many of these games, no matter what level they're, and, and who they're built for, and you know, Robio does this, is the microtransaction. So you know, the game might be free or the game might be a dollar, but once they kind of capture those users, they're then monetizing them in new ways, whether it's using UPI virtual currency or whether it's, you know, if it's a social game, Facebook credits, or whether it's, you know, whether it's something on the, uh, the iOS platform. But I mean, that, you know, that's, you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of the quote unquote freemium model, basically, and, and something that, you know, uh, a, a, a term of art that my, you know my firm's been talking about recently, which is gamblification. 
Um, you know, although I hate game the term gamification, so I think I hate gamblification even more. But um, you know, you're adding like everyone wants to add those elements and monetize you know games and make them look more and more like sweepstakes or you know make them look you know like gamble like you know casino games. Do you, do you know what percentage of revenue in games from in iOS games is from game sales as opposed to in-game sales? Is there like uh, they say more money? I, I don't know percentage because Apple doesn't. Apple's not very transparent with those numbers. Um, I believe they themselves have said, or, or maybe outside firms that do all the tracking, said that um, more money is made from in-app purchases now than actual purchases. And if you look at the top grossing apps, like tons of the games, if not the majority are. That's right, Apple made top grossing transparent, so we can tell from that. Yeah. Well, my sister spent $900 on Smurf berries. I don't believe she knew she did, but. <laughs> my daughter did, they spent $200 one night on a zombie game. And I, I went to the website of the, the uh, developer or publisher, and it was the whole page was this, don't blame us, blame Apple. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if you know what's going on. But anyway, um, there's a moral hazard in that, too. There's just an article I forget who posted. Like, I just saw this morning someone posting on the moral hazard presented by in-game app sales, because it is so much toward young, you know, young people. Well, that's why Never Apple changing. Apple dealt with it slightly by putting in the whole kind of like 15 minute timeout for you know you want to purchase something you got to put in your you know your password and everything like that and it's only going to stay good for what 15 minutes before yeah. it kind of times out again but you can spend a lot of money in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try race. Um, <laughs> that could be a game. <laughs> you have uh, yeah you I mean that also saying you know it, I think the Steam equivalent a lot of times uh, on iOS it's like updates free updates regular updates. On Steam, a lot of times it's the sale, and Valve has a lot of, um, and they've published. I mean, Valve, on the other hand, is very transparent about all this stuff. Not sales numbers, but um, general data trends. But Valve, uh, I think it was even Gabe Newell, published a long post about how you would think that these crazy sales that they have, fifty dollar game on sale for five dollars today. And it's like, okay, um, you think this would have a, um, a deleterious effect on the value of that game, that nobody would ever want to buy it again. Uh, they've found that it has the opposite effect, that it actually spikes the sales, not only for that $5 period, but then when it goes back to 50, it's still selling uh, at a higher rate than it was before. Um, and they've written a lot about this and used um, real world scenarios and other, you've actually seen more information come from publishers that have done it. And, and I've success. talked to publishers, they say that too. So yeah. I mean, definitely mm -hmm. like everyone agrees. Um, and it's, it's a crazy phenomenon, it's really strange, but um, it works like crazy. Some of it is that, especially if it's a, um, a very, uh, I don't know, let's say, shocking type of sale, like a brand new game, really cheap, all the press outlets will cover it, so you just got a lot of yeah. coverage right there. Um, some people will, uh, you know, I meant to download that, it was free this weekend, I guess it's not gonna be free again for a while, or cheap again for a while, I'll get it for 50 bucks. Whatever the psychology is, it, it works. Do you think any of it is just how people feel about Steam too? I mean, like feel of it, like what the brand means to them, and like what's something sold there, so a discount means something different than my game. Else, I mean, there are those. There are those. Um, I think the feelings that some people have, but it doesn't explain on a game by game basis why certain sales do well. I think you know even that audience, that Steam audience, it's a huge audience. I think there are some people that are like that, but it's not the whole audience. But you know, it's, it's one of those strange scenarios where I, I don't think even a lot of the biggest publishers fully understand why that works, but it does. So if you have a game on Steam, um, you know, doing a kind of discount and promoting a discount, if you can have your discount as a part of something else, like you know, Valve itself does, like sometimes these these planned discount periods, like if you can be involved in that, even if it means like offering it to them, like hey, we would love to like discount our game heavily next time you guys do something. Um, that definitely works for, for sales. Um, obviously for the discounted sales, but even return sales. I, I think the most kind of like evil thing I ever saw, which, which really cracked me up was, in a particular game, there was this really attractive Romanian woman who had all these friends. And so the game, <laughs> the game developer basically gave her for free like a thousand, I don't know, it was like digital sheep or something like that, and said, you gotta give them out to people. And so she did. She had all these friends. She gave them out to like a thousand friends she had or whatnot. And then those thousand friends all bought the digital sheep to like send back to her. 
So they like basically seeded these free things into this economy, basically with the idea that since she was a hot girl, everyone was going to want to up one up her if they give something. So they would go out and buy all these things. And actually they showed like a, a spike in, in the economy and the sales of these items over the course of like the day or two that they had done that. And that's I was terrifying. like, I'm like, that's like evil genius in my mind. <laughs> it's kind of sad too. I imagine a bunch of people buying virtual sheep to give to a virtual person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really sad. Really. It's better than buying cows. But. I mean, the stuff that comes out that does resonate is something you just never really quite see it coming. You know, like maybe years ago, someone would say, yeah, I got, you know, I'll, you pull back this little bird and you knock down these buildings that, that kill. It's just like you'd be like, what? This guy's smoking crack. <laughs> but somebody in this room may have an idea that's just as bizarre when you talk about it, but could change the world, you know? I, I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest. Maybe you do. Um, I would say one of the things I think sells really well over and over again, uh, repeatedly, is nostalgia. Um, whether it's aesthetic, whether it's gameplay, whether it's the name, whether it's tongue-in-cheek or serious. Um, that does really well. It does really well with games writers uh, who are going to write about your game. It does really well with people who are surfing a store and want something that looks familiar to them. And so familiarity can be a brand name. You know, EA is some of EA's most best performing games are, are the Hasbro licensed games because people know Battleship and they know Scrabble. Although even then, Scrabble doesn't come close to denting uh, words of friends. So, you know, it, um, there's still an opportunity for, for up, uh, newcomers to that interesting story about words of friends that was made by, like I was saying before, um, the guys that worked at Ensemble Studios in Texas, they did uh, Age of Empires and stuff. Microsoft shut them down after Halo Wars. They formed three different studios. Some guys went over and formed Robot that supported Halo Wars. Some other guys did, uh, I forget. Uh, they did Orcs Must Die, I forget the name of the studio. <laughs> so. and then um, the, fa the brothers uh, that founded Ensemble made New Toy, and they made a, a competitive multiplayer Scrabble game. And everyone was like, what are you doing? You guys are, that's weird. You made like hardcore RTSs for a decade. And uh, then they sold it to Zynga for a hundred bajillion dollars, so not doing so bad. Um, but, but nostalgia works really well. Um, it's, it's a really powerful mechanism in, in the app store where all you need sometimes is, is um, something to grab people's attention that can do it. Uh, it can do it very like, easily. Um, the downside to that is that a lot of apps, and you still have to back it up with a good app. One, one thing I would add to what he's saying, there's almost the polar opposite, is take a really close look at the latest, whatever the latest iPad is or the latest phone. And look at those little like technical progressions, whether it's Siri or Retina Display or these these little things. Go, what can I make a game with that uses the most cutting edge Apple stuff? I mean, maybe there's a game out there that uses Siri somehow. I don't I don't know of it, but maybe there is something that uses the ultra high res display that does something different in games. If you do that, your chances of, of uh, getting some attention go way, way up, I think, specifically from Apple itself. I think there's definitely stuff you can do with Siri. I mean, I was laughing hysterically the other day. My father-in-law, who's pretty much a Luddite, just got mm -hmm. the new iPhone and, you know, was talking to Siri and everything he asked her, she was like, I don't know, I can't find that, blah, 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 blah. And then he actually sat there and he got so pissed off, he goes, Siri, go jump off a, uh, you know, go ju no, Siri, go jump off a pier. And she goes, and she's like, Dr. Vukovic, there are six peers right near your house. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, there's a game right there? That could be hilarious. <laughs> um, but uh, with, I guess, for, you know, following up on, on what they were saying, with, with me, kind of, I think the same thing um, that excites me, it scares me. Um, you're seeing more and more companies, as I just said, like adding these things uh, that look like gambling into their games. And, you know, we're watching so many different companies that are getting involved in it, you know, like full-on gambling companies have been buying social game companies, mobile game companies. Um, we're seeing, you know, companies like, you know, Betfair out of the UK just made a big investment in Kabam. Um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, traditional casino companies have bought these, uh, these, other, these other companies. And, and, and we're seeing these things. We're also seeing changes in the law slightly. So the Department of Justice came out now and said, hey, you know what? Uh, only online sports betting is illegal under this, you know, particular act. So it opens it up for states to start to say, well, you know, are we going to allow these things? Are we going to allow kind of gambling online within our jurisdictions? And 
you know, New Jersey's looking to pass laws that say yes, and Vegas basically is now allowing um, app-based gambling as long as they're geolocated, so that you have to be in Vegas, but you don't have to be down, you know, you can be up in your room playing a hand of blackjack or whatnot. You don't have to be down in the casino doing it. So, you know, that, that opens up a lot of really interesting changes, and, uh, but it's an area that's so highly regulated that more and more companies are just like, well, wait, the Justice Department said we can do this. Great, let's go do it, blah, blah, blah. You know, and this is an area where, you know, you go to jail. You know, if you, if, you, if you don't do it properly, you go to jail. So that's why I think it's exciting because we're going to see some of these things. Um, no, not, no, sorry, not people going to jail. No, no, no. Um, I th it's exciting because it opens up all these new opportunities for people to, like, add these elements. But it scares the hell out of me because there is no law on it. And so we're really going to be making it up on the come until, until more states have, you know, kind of, uh, you know, institutionalized what their, what their laws are going to be. It's going to be really strange, isn't it, if it's state by state but online? It's Completely. Yeah, and it's got to be state by state unless states decide they would ha literally have to enter into treaties between states to say, oh, sure, New York, you can gamble in New Jersey. But otherwise, it's going to have to be like, well, no, it's just in our jurisdiction. We're allowing it here, but it may not be allowed, you know, 50 miles in the, in the other direction. That's the whole games of skill versus games of chance, right? So games of skill, but even that's you can't a really big difference. Life. I mean, there's people doing StarCraft. Yes and no. They're not stuff. games of skill aren't legal everywhere. It's like 37 yeah. states or something like that, and I think on a federal level, it's legal, right? It's not really federal just, law on. on Some the, people doing like StarCraft now for money. I mean, I know some. People well, a part of that is also yeah. being done on like there. There are there are. <clears throat> Quote unquote, it, it, you have to look on what is gambling, and there are there are different federal laws and state laws on this is a bet, this is not a bet, mm. um, and so you know there there are certain things that that you might be able to do between players that you can't do as a company that's setting up the the system, mm. um, because at one time you're basically a gambling den, whereas another one you're just you know facilitating potentially um, some gameplay aspects. I think this stuff's interesting. And full disclosure, we do work with somebody that's kind of building some tech behind some of that. But I like the idea of, of somehow it being simple to be good at a game and, and connect with people. And it's like, I'm going to beat you at fight night. Let's play for five bucks and have it not be a pain. That'd sure. Be pretty cool. So uh, well, again, part of it comes down to like whether what are you are you using real money or not? Mm -hmm. um, because okay. quite a lot of these games. I mean, I, mean, I you know, you, you're talking. You're talking about you know the auction house. We, you know, my, my firm helped them set things like that. Help them set that up. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll talk. We'll we'll work through it and say, okay, well, you know, is there a market for this currency? Yes or no. You know, you can buy in, but can you cash out? That's one level. Um, if you can't cash out, well, that makes it a lot more likely that it's not real currency. What you have is a limited license to access an element of the game. That element of the game seems to be you know, resemble a purchasing power, but it doesn't, you're not really getting that power. Um, and so you're not actually then buying anything from that little cash shop because you don't own what you bought. You only have a license to visually see that item, which may or may not power you up. So there's, there's all these different levels that we have to work on to make certain that I'm not spending a dollar to bet something which may or may not then be valuable that I own. So. Without looking exactly at it, you know, I can't say yes, that was fine, or no, it isn't. But you know, this is how we re work with people to make certain that they have enough arguments to say, hey, there was no gambling because I didn't wager anything, I didn't purchase anything, you know, so I didn't get anything. I knew that going in that that would be hard to get awareness about a game if we wanted to sell it directly. So we're hoping to get the name out there through this free-to-play version. Um, um, that's just, you know, it's going to be auctioned off on Flash Game License. And I, I don't know if that's, if that's a brilliant or a very flawed <laughs> belief. Do you know Splunky? Yes, I've heard Splunky. I don't know the story behind this at all. But Splunky's Flash Game, it's coming out to Xbox Live Arcade probably this summer or something as like an enhanced version. So it sounds like what you're saying is something similar, which is a, it's a proven model. Let people whet their appetite for something. Um, and give them an opportunity to do it on a platform that they want. Not that many people probably want to play a Flash game, you know, with a keyboard and mouse. But you know, if that introduces them to the game, I mean, Super Meat Boy started that way yeah, um, as, as Meat Boy, um, and then and then it's like it's a proven model. You know, I would say just, I would say don't uh, don't 
give away the cow just yet, you know. Uh, put some of it out there and and, um, and and work on making the the commercial version better. Right now we're in the day day and age of um, of patent trolls, and so. You know, I mean, that, that, that's a huge thing. They're being filed against not just big companies, they're being filed against startups as well. Um, so that's, that, that's something you want to, you, you want to consider. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, the other point we kind of talked about a little bit before is cloning games. I mean, you know, there's, there, there are ways to clone games that are completely legal. There are ways to clone games that are not. Um, if you're talking about negotiating agreements and that sort of thing, the most, what are the most important things? I mean, the most important things are going to be, you know, uh, IP ownership, um, and you know it may be it might be really important to you to have things in there like right of first refusals for other games or um, you know it could be it could be important um, again if it's if it's a deal that you're doing a development agreement or a publishing agreement there's going to be different things you need to worry about um, you know publishing agreement as we as I said earlier one of the one of the biggest things is really like you know define how what these revenue shares are going to look like um, and you know, just just make certain that you have, you know, clear clear understanding of what's going to fall into those things, and stay out of the cross collateralization situations. Unless it doesn't matter if you're only doing an iOS game or something like that, it really not going to matter too much about cross collateralization. Um, uh, you also want to you also want to be worrying about um, you know really what you know what platforms and how a publisher can can use your game because. You know, they. You may not want to give them a license to everything. You may only want to give them a license to one particular, uh, you know, platform. But you might, you might want to say you have an you have an iOS license, but you don't have an Android license, um, because the value on some of these things exists to be split up in many different ways, um, and you got to be careful of the old school where, you know, people always put the tag on, you know, and then I have it on anything other technology that may exist in the future. Because there's a shitload of technology that's going to exist in the future, and you know why give away? As I said before, why give away the cow now when you know you may find that you know you've got a you know you've got a real market a marketable product on some other platform that nobody's even considered yet. Uh, and you know bigger things are you know you got to look at terms. You know I mean like and by that I mean like how long is someone going to have a license? Um, you know what type of you know are those licenses going to automatically re up? Um, you know, and I always like to see them, they only automatically re-up if you hit certain um, thresholds, so at least you know as a company, yeah, sure, this publisher, you're going to get another year out of this, but that's only if you've hit these markets, you know, it's only if you've had a million downloads, and, you know, uh, as, long, as long as I know I've made enough money to have the Ferrari in the backyard, sure, you guys get another year on it. Um, you keep your Ferrari in the backyard. I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, because you know I've got too many other nicer cars in my garage. <laughs> okay. yep. um, well, what about just an operating agreement for the people to oh, develop? Oh, uh, well, that, I mean, that's take the, even on the most basic. It may go without saying, but yeah. I've seen some people have some real problems. Yeah. Le yeah. Um, let me let me be very very clear yeah. on that. Anyone you have working for you, you need to have them on you know signed agreement that basically takes any intellectual property they rights and anything they create and seeds it to the company because people don't realize that. They're like, oh yeah, but you know, I worked with this person, this you know, third party and you know, I paid them so I own what they created. That's not the case. You know, if it's your employee, arguably yes, you do own what they've created, but you still want them to sign it anyways. If it's a contractor, you have to have it in writing and it has to specifically say work for hire and transfer the stuff over because I've seen too many people that have gotten screwed later on when a game became successful and that contractor came out and they're like, hey, well, you know, I did all this stuff, you're infringing my, my, my work, even though you paid me for it, now I'd like, you know, write me a Thank big check. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm a lawyer. I know. <laughs> absolutely everything. Thank you. <laughs>